Now we're going to move on uh, quickly to our next session. Our next session is going to deal uh, pretty specifically, I think, Maria will confirm or not, um, with the, one of the central missions of the uh, European Commission, which is to uh, help uh, uh, cities, European cities, achieve uh, carbon uh, neutral status by the year 2030. Now, Maria and her team are going to question whether that's actually possible. So I think we might get down to uh, real basics here. So please, can I welcome to uh, the stage Maria Savacidis, EIT of Urban Mobility, and uh, she is also president of Mobility Tomorrow. Maria, please. Maria will come here. She'll introduce her panelists who are going to uh, deal with this rather tricky problem. Maria, over to you. Thank you very much. So, COP26 has taught us that with measures committed today, we are on the path to 2.4 degrees global warming compared to pre-industrial times. Also, what we've learned from a report on global carbon budget that was presented at COP is that to achieve net zero by 2050, we would need to reduce emissions every year by the same amount as during 2020, which we know, of course, was the peak of the pandemic where transport basically came to a stop. So knowing this and taking also into account that transport has been the only sector that has actually until today been increasing its carbon emissions, um, how do we see climate neutrality uh, unfold and it seems we know it's a necessity but it's also a very daring target. This plenary discussion will discuss the climate neutral and smart cities mission to reach 100 climate neutral cities by 2030 and naturally we will be looking at this especially from the perspective of transport and the mobility sector. The mission was launched earlier this year and is one of the key initiatives of the European Commission to reach the objective of becoming carbon neutral by 2050. So now we have a panel of five fantastic people who with their organizations are, are trying to make this mission possible. And they will help us understand the ambition and what it takes to get there. So please welcome with us here today on stage, Arianna Cenzi, the Deputy Mayor for Mobility of the City of Milan. Kirsten Dunlop, my dear colleague, the CEO of EIT Climate Kick. And Olga Cordas. Olga is the Program Director of Viable Cities, and she comes from the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm. And joining us online are Annalisa Boni, Annalisa is the Secretary General of EuroCities and the representative of the Mission Board. And Matthew, our only male leader today on stage, is a Deputy Director General of DG Move and the Mission Manager for the Climate Neutral and Smart Cities at the European Commission. So, welcome everyone. I'm very pleased to have this distinguished panel with me here today. So, we want to first give all our panelists the floor to make some opening comments and share with us their perspectives on how we make cities climate neutral. And then we will go into a debate and discuss some of the key questions around climate neutral cities. So I would like to start with you, Matthew. And would you like to give us a little bit of context around the mission? Well, good morning. Thanks. As the only guy, I guess it's only fair that I should go first. Um, it's great. I'm sorry I'm not with you personally. We'd lovely to be in Barcelona and, to, and to, to have been present for that vivid discussion on the new European Bauhaus and super blocks. And I think we flow absolutely naturally from that. And you've already, I think, Maria, given us some excellent context because Glasgow um, Glasgow is what Glasgow is, right? Um, it, it, you summarized it very well. We've got to go further and faster. And particularly, we've got to get down to implementation. At some point, the negotiations will stop and we have to implement. And we have to implement fast. 
that is the, the lesson I draw. I, I love the way you frame this panel. Is it mission possible or mission impossible? And I'm coming out swinging. If it is too difficult, then the whole European Green Deal is too difficult. We have to be able to achieve this in the most ambitious cities of Europe. And I'm reassured from the discussions I've had uh, in Glasgow with a number of different mayors that they're ready to go. They're prime for action to deliver climate neutrality all the way in, 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 in a 100 cities across Europe by 2030. Briefly on the context, just to look at the numbers, if we're going to do 55% by 2030, that's what the European Green Deal pledges to do as a stepping stone on the way to full climate neutrality as a continent by 2050. <laughs> Some guys are going to have to go faster than others. I think we all know where there are going to be difficulties within the European Union. And so why not cities? Not why cities, why not cities? Cities are the crossroads where policy meet people. It's the place where you meet the mayors of genuine ambition and drive, where you have citizens who are ready to not just deliver climate neutrality, but to enjoy the co-benefits that flow with that, the cleaner air, the less congestion, the lower energy bills. Um, and that's the, that's the energy and the excitement that I picked up all across Glasgow. It was truly impressive. And it's also wonderful to be using Horizon Europe as the basis of this because you can't get there without innovating. Not new technological lab innovations necessarily, but innovations in governance, like the new European Bauhaus, like the Superblocks idea, born in Barcelona, being implemented across the European Union. What are we proposing in detail? It is to have 100 cities from across the European Union, and I mean across the European Union, we want to have at least in principle one or more from each member state. This is a mission that's got to look like the European Union, as Bill Clinton once said about his, his first cabinet, and we're determined to have that. And I'm encouraged by the response from the south and the east of Europe, and not just the usual suspects to the north and west. We published an info kit online that includes a, a lot of information about the, the, the wherewithal, if you like, of climate neutrality. But it also prepares, I, I hope it prepares cities well for the call for expression of interest. Um, and I'm going to be brave and put a date on that. We're aiming to get that out on the 25th of November. We will ask cities to respond then by the end of January. I, we will have what I hope is a very difficult challenge to choose the first 100 cities. And we'll be going live, and you'll hear more about that in a minute from Kirsten, with the Net Zero Cities Consortium then from April, with the first group of around 25 to 30 cities. Here we are talking about mobility in Barcelona. Mobility is a core part of this. It's possibly the toughest sector of all, the toughest sector to, to, for, for which cities can monetize their investments, uh, the, the sector that's most involved with individual behavior. Um, and so I think it's great that we are having this discussion here in the context of mobility, but we know we have to do that. And once again, if we can reduce our dependence on privately owned, conventionally fueled cars, we can start to realize those co-benefits and we can start to really bring down those numbers quite quickly. But these are some of the livest discussions we're having with, uh, uh, with city mayors. Some of you may say, well, why do we need yet another in, uh, um, a scheme coming from the European Union? We've got the covenant of mayors, we've got all kinds of good things and they are good things and we're going to work on the basis of what's happened already. We're going to use existing methodologies uh, um, uh, and we're not trying to reinvent the wheel. The difference is that we're inviting cities to go all the way to neutrality, not a certain percentage reduction, uh, not uh, in one in this sector or that sector. And it's city based, bottom up, um, as I said earlier, innovation based, based on the detailed plans by cities and crucially, including investment plans. I'm sure we'll come on to talk about the money, but um, and the, 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 the finance will be the crucial element for here. There's a lot of money floating around out there. We have to bring it down to the city level and make sure that they can go ahead with their investments. I think I want to stop there because I know uh, we, we won't have plenty of time for discussion. But once again, if this is too ambitious, as some people say to me, um, then we are really in trouble globally and at the European Union level. Some people may say that following the discussions in Glasgow, it's not ambitious enough and that 20, climate neutrality by 2030 of cities should in fact be the new standard, not the uh, wild aspiration. Um, uh, we are coming to an end uh, uh, in the negotiations process. Implementation is the next step. And frankly speaking, the more ambitious and, and the more tigerish our cities are, the better we will all be. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matthew. So, Annalisa, you are leading 
Euro cities, so one of the major city networks in Europe, but you're also on the mission board. Um, so how do you see the role of cities and that of urban mobility in the context of climate change? Well, that's a huge uh, question. <laughs> it's a very general question, but uh, maybe talking about the, the mission, because as you said, uh, I was part of the mission board and I was the rapporteur of the report that, uh, that made the proposal of the 100 cities uh, mission. So first of all, in terms of the challenge, uh, 2030 is like tomorrow, right? It's 80 years and it's nothing, it's like, oh my God. And uh, on top of that, we know that 72% of the CO2 emissions is coming from cities. And by 2050, 85% 80, of the European population is expected to live in cities. So, you know, only that gives you anxiety if you think about it. So it just that idea makes you think, you know, going on with business as usual is just not even thinkable. It's not just even possible. So if you say that, but then, Going back to what Matthew said, why not? Here, why? Exactly because of that anxiety, then you have to go and find a solution to that anxiety because it comes from the cities. It's, it's, it's there in the cities. So cities are also the, how do you say, the, the melting pot where, you know, decarbonization strategies for energy, transport, buildings, and even industry and agriculture, in a way, coexist. And they, you know, connect. Um, and, you know, the density of use and uh, infrastructure is higher in cities. Uh, because of that, there's higher potential for, you know, integration and for, you know, difficult, you know, heavy and complex infrastructures such, such as the, the smart grids and so on. So, you know, working in a different way is possible in cities. And you have, you know, access to more capital, know-how, you can create the economies of scale, which are really to you know, do things differently. So what I want, wanted to say is that because of the, you know, the, all the issues that are going on there, it is exactly the right place where we need to, to act. And also they are the right place uh, where we need to act because, you know, a lot of population, a lot of citizens, we, you know, the majority of us live there. Uh, and so by, you know, engaging citizens ourselves who are not only political actors in a governance structure but you know we're users producers consumers and owners of buildings and so on in all this capacity we can have we can be um, agents of change and have a huge impact on the environment so cities are the right level uh, where to you know where we can face uh, climate change whether we can fight climate change of course they can't do it alone and that's why the 100 cities um, you know climate neutral cities mission is so important because and it's so different also to the other initiatives that were mentioned be before it it brings ambition it brings innovation and brings action um, it's really something where you know through the climate city contracts different levels of government will and should uh, be working together, but also horizontal governance should stay, you know, should be at the at the core of the concept. So, and that's what um, is creating enthusiasm, I think, uh, from our cities, uh, because it's a journey that they see super difficult as super challenging, but at the same time is what they need uh, in terms of, you know, moving to climate neutrality, because they need, again, something that is systemic, they need something that is not usual, uh, business as usual. They need something where they they see that the national level is, you know, as committed as themselves, the European level, the local level, you know, it, it's really like they need this kind of sort of different way of working. And, you know, we have not only major cities like Copenhagen or London and so on, and or smaller ones like Turku and Ulu, which are, you know, Finland and therefore, you know, this sort of uses usual suspects but we also have cities across Europe like Marseille, Marseille they are incredibly motivated, Porto, Prague, you know this is really um, there is enthusiasm. Of course the pandemic situation as you know at the beginning we could think uh, oh my god this is gonna change everything but actually not. We, we had a recent survey across Euro cities and you know, that we did ourselves. And it was shown that really more than 65% of the people that responded <clears throat> are still revising the climate ambitions to align them with the green plan and the sort of climate target. 
so yeah that that's for me it's really what i wanted to say now on on the mobility part at the end of the day yeah mobility is super important is not the, the, the most uh, important emitters because we have the building the built-in environment the built environment uh, but even on mobility since we are on, on a forum <laughs> that deals with mobility it's clear that cities do believe that you know, going um, relying only on cleaner vehicles, it's not the, the only thing. It's really about reducing the place of cars in cities to those that really cannot avoid using it completely, develop public transport and making space for active mobility really like you know, important pieces of the same puzzle in order to achieve climate neutrality. So, yeah, ju just what, to conclude, I think that what, what matters most is to is to really say this mission can federate, can help everyone working together. And in this case, yeah, innovation, as I said, uh, um, you know, creativity, imagination, ambition, and unity are the, the sort of ingredients. So yeah, I think, I really believe that this should work. Thank you very much, Annalisa. So we've heard a little bit the European perspective of it. So. And there is, of course, the national and local perspective, so where it all needs to happen. So we've heard the cities are very enthusiastic about it. So Olga, um, it's not, so those climate um, city contracts are not something that's far away in the future. It's not something theoretical, but it's already happening. So it's happening in Sweden. So tell us about it. Thank you. And um, so we had a great intro introduction to the mission thinking on the European level, and I'm very happy to share with you our experiences in Sweden of uh, piloting and prototyping the mission-oriented approach in Sweden with our cities. Viable Cities, we are a strategic innovation program of Sweden, and uh, we have a mission of climate-neutral cities by 2030 with a good life for all within planetary boundaries. This mission provides a common direction for our actions, but also connects uh, climate targets and other sustainable development goals. So we are not working with climate action in isolation. So we had the first mission-oriented uh, call for proposal already 2018, uh, for three years ago. And then uh, with this call, we have uh, nine cities uh, in Sweden who are um, taking the lead, accelerating climate transition, together with their partners from academia, from industry, from civil society organizations. Together with these nine cities uh, and also four governmental agencies on the national level, we co-created the first climate city contracts uh, on the national level. Uh, and then it took us eight months from the concept of climate city contract. Don't know what is that about yet, uh, or we didn't know that time. Uh, we thought, okay, is it legally binding or is it uh, politically binding? So from the question, what is that about, but probably powerful tool to signature of the climate city contract, it took us eight months. And this is because we created the space of trust and excitement uh, among our cities. Um, so what are those uh, kind of uh, elements of uh, transformational pathways that we have uh, in Sweden? One is the multi-level governance, and this is both horizontal, so how to involve all departments in the municipalities, all municipal companies, but also industry, civil society organizations in this transformation. And vertical, how to align efforts on the uh, local, regional, and national level, and in the future also European level. So this is very important, crucial for us. The second one is systemic transformation, systemic innovation, and uh, transformative portfolios. So we are used to think about these fragmented projects here and there, bits and pieces. The city of Stockholm uh, formulated a very brilliant question, actually, why those pilots and tests that were successful are not standard yet, why we're still talking about graveyards of pilots. So the city of Stockholm is uh, now having a very interesting initiative that is called uh, Sustainability is a Standard. And if you know, want to know more about that, just grab our colleagues from the city of Stockholm in the booth close to the Nordic Pavilion. Uh, the third is, of course, this financing. Uh, so how to mobilize uh, um, investments from public and private sectors, but also how to redirect 
the uh, available funding. If you think about public procurement in Sweden, uh, so approximately per year, our municipalities are procuring, say, 50 billion euro. And our mayor says that we need to, to make it so that every single Swedish krona that we procure would lead to new lead markets, to new products and services towards the mission. So this is another very important uh, thing we are doing together. So why, when we started to work with cities, uh, with climate city contracting and those transformations, we created demand, demand for change. And now from the 1st of October, we, from nine cities, we scale up and we have 23 cities in Sweden together with us, and they are having 40% <coughs> of Swedish population. So we could scale up from 9 to 23, and now the big question is, how do we scale up from 23 to 290 that we have? Uh, so uh, I would finalize maybe this, the first introductory remarks with also questions that we are getting very often. Is this feasible to, to be a climate neutral by 2030? I hear what Matthew is saying and also Annalisa. So for us, it, it's, of course, it's very challenging. And, uh, but, but we are sure that if we don't mobilize resources, if we don't mobilize actors, then we have no chance to be there by 2030. So the question is not what. I think we don't need to discuss more, okay, should we do, should we, what should we do, but how. And I'm so happy to collaborate with uh, Annalisa, with Eurocities, and also with Climate Kick in this finding how. And we can find how only by prototyping, learning, reflecting, doing, and having very short feedback loops between doing, implementing, and strategy development and re redesign. Thank you. Thank you very much, Olga. So this sounds very encouraging indeed. Um, so let's hear it from Ariana now. So from the city of Milan. So you are the ones who in the end need to implement um, all of the, the great uh, pilots and, and the measures and to bring it together into solutions for citizens. So tell us a little bit about the Milan experience and what you're doing uh, to move towards climate neutrality. Thank, thank you, Maria, and thank you to all of you for this occasion. This is my, my first speech because uh, I'm, I'm doing this job from uh, three weeks, just a month. But uh, we, we want to realize what you are saying. I mean, methodological and way of working. In a particular city, Milan is a, a part of polycentrical urban region and uh, is the heart of an urban system in where city and countryside coexist. And um, Milan is characterized by a strong urban density and due a particular unfavorable weather condition is one of the most pollution city in Europe, maybe in the world. Air pollution is for this one of the most uh, significant problems of our, our area and it's every important impact of human health. And in the last two years, in the last one year and a half, uh, all the people has put in the core of the, the way of thinking, wellness, the condition of the health. And for this reason, uh, the improvement of air quality is uh, the top priority of Milan. Because uh, of the awareness that is necessary to act to govern the process uh, that lead Milan's air quality to observe the limit values sent uh, by you standard of the World Health Organization guideline that Milan approved in 2020 uh, in the, uh, an act that is uh, air and climate plane that we call PAC and um, a system of coordinating action aimed to achieve the dual objective of protecting health and making Milano a connected and highly accessible city. The transition to a zero emission city for Milano has a dimension that is not only territorial and demographical, but uh, is economical, 
social and cultural, aware of belonging to a complex urban system. In order to keep together the goal of health protection and the connection between national and European dimension, the action proposed by the air and climate uh, plane, and I would like to remember it is a, um, a, a voluntary action. There is no law. We decided to give us rules and uh, to take care of an innovative and transversal goal as a various planning or programming tools. The challenge of the plane, as well as the goal and the action we have indicated, reflect the commitment to reduce atmospheric pollution, CO2 emission, and the development of adaptation strategies undertaken by the administration as part of the adhesion of the international works. So uh, if uh, the C40 cities climate network, the urban agenda, and uh, the covenant on major, and again, the 100 resilient city network, if we take care, we, we, have, we have to do this. And we want to reach three objectives, the, the, the fall within the limit value of the concentration of uh, the atmospheric pollution, so in particular PM10 and NOx, uh, to protect the public air until 2050, and to reduce emission of CO2 carbon, not uh, in... Uh, is 55% uh, in uh, low emission city models until 2030 to become a carbon neutral city in 2050. And uh, to the last goal is to contribute to limiting the local temperature increase by 2050 by two degrees. And it's not so easy in our, in our time. And the last thing is to create community in which each one, each one, uh, think that this job is our job, is job. And so we work together to reach uh, three diff very difficult goals for uh, our city. But I'm, I'm sure that if we use European help, European way of thinking, and we use uh, um, creativity, Italian creativity, we can build a new community. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ariana. So you did very well on your first speech. <laughs> so, Kirsten, we heard from Ariana. So uh, the community is key. Um, so, and in the community, everyone has to take ownership of the problem. So this is what EIT is about, right? So tell us a little bit about how we bring this mission to life and um, the role of innovation in it. Thank you very much, Maria, and, uh, and thank you to all of you. It's a, actually an extraordinary privilege to be uh, discussing from multiple points of perspectives what is effectively the beginnings of a partnership to deliver on the world's currently most ambitious set of climate commitments in the world. Um, 100 cities going to full decarbonization by 2030 is a big deal. First, let me just explain a little bit. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of EIT Climate Kick, proud to be partnering with EIT Urban Mobility, part of the EIT community, very much about a partnership and a community of other actors. So this is about aggregation. Um, and we are here uh, in, as Matthew mentioned, in the role of leading the consortium of partners, of 30-something partners that will be working together with your cities, with ICLE, with Viable Cities, and also bringing into that a lot of experience of having worked as a partnership um, through the last three years or so, trying to bring to life as a practitioner what it means to name the notion of systems, systems transformation, innovation, and pragmatism in the same breath. And we have, in fact, had the privilege to work with Milan and learn enormously just how difficult, how challenging, and what an enormous opportunity that represents. So I'd want to build on a couple of things. Very much this is about how. Um, this is a really big challenge, and we should not underestimate the work in front of us. It's not a small thing to name this as the most ambitious program currently in the world, and it's not a small thing to deliver on it. And I think speaking on behalf of many of the cities that we've been working with in the last few years, cities 
in my experience, don't really need any more sense of accountability for the challenges of climate and the challenges of health, of social integration, of just transformation. So in some ways, upping the ante and creating a climate city contract that sort of formally signs up to 2030, which is a stretch goal that we know almost no city can really confidently say we know exactly how to get there. That's a big ask. That really does raise the bar significantly. And I think the mission, the concept of a mission-led logic, describes the need for innovation to address a gap, what I would describe as the space between a set of roadmaps and policy commitments, including, for example, sustainable urban mobility plans, and the reality of hundreds of viable, interesting, small, individual, larger-scale solutions. In fact, if you walk out here, the hundreds of solutions and prototypes that are out there that nonetheless do not come together and form a systemic transformation without help and without a significant set of connections between multiple levels of governance, between a significant set of realizations of where the issues and the problematics are in misalignment between different governance, between different pieces of policy and planning and regulation and laws, often between local and regional, or between regional and city and provincial and national, or indeed pan-European. There are real complexities and challenges in how to weave this together. So the mission describes a space of needing to pull together many different solutions, to try them, as Olga was describing, in rapid feedback loops that connect them into policy and to connect them in such a way that they can form a new design for life. I think that's probably where I'd also want to connect this conversation with a conversation prior to us. This is ultimately, and the mission is for, the mission on cities is for forging a new design for life in the spaces and the places where in the greatest aggregation we enact our current design for life, the way we think mobility works, the way we want to move about, the way we work, the way we think about economics and value and so on. And cities, as Matthew said, this is a bottom-up initiative, represent the greatest possible concentration of those choices. So an opportunity space to both acknowledge the impact of choices and to redesign different alternatives with the people that will uh, live within them. And the last element I want to bring together is the, the kind of purpose of this mission, working together as a consortium, working together with 100 cities, has two really critical pieces of the puzzle when it comes to how. One of them is about building the infrastructure for innovation to have an effect. And that is an infrastructure that has to do with capital and a different structure and a mechanism for bringing in different forms of capital, for blending them together, for creating city structures for capital and for community structures for capital. It has to do with governance, very different ways of thinking about how we structure governance, information, information architecture, digital platforms, and social mechanisms for participatory decision-making, voting, deciding, determining together at community street and neighborhood what the future of a city and the future of life in particular places would be. I think one of the things we must never forget is this is not a hundred cookie-cutter templates. This is 100 individual living, gritty cities that have a sense of purpose and identity and culture and food and self and that needs to be part of the fabric of our design. But most importantly, what it does from the perspective of a pan-European, regional, local, and national is this sets a directional signal for all of the innovations that are there to actually scale and get past the graveyard of pilots. We need a really strong, courageous, steady directional signal for dramatic change so that markets wake up and go, okay, 100 cities procuring, 100 cities starting to act together, that's a different market. Now I need to scale up. Now I need to accelerate. And I think that is the opportunity you have for both enacting practically how we do innovation differently, working together with every part of the decision-making system, and really starting to bring in a set of signals to markets that change the attention. Thank you very much, uh, Kirsten. So I think uh, we've heard very, very interesting angles. Um, to this problem, and I would like to follow up on something that Kirsten said, but also Olga and Matthew in the beginning, which is um, we need capital, massive capital for this, so how are we going to ensure there is enough funding and finance for cities? And I would like to ask uh, Matthew, <laughs> with the deep pockets of the European Commission, uh, first on this, and then anyone 
who wants to add, of course, um, can add afterwards. So, Matthew, how are we financing all this? Well, uh, you're absolutely right to ask the question. I mean, ultimately, we will do so uh, uh, for each city in these climate city contracts, which the Net Zero Cities Consortium will lead on, and the connected investment plans. There will be a certain amount of money. We have about 300 millions already uh, being deployed under Horizon Europe. Cities will get more access through the mission label to structural funds, to funds coming from the recovery and resilience facility. We hope also national funds. But it's a lot of money. None of this is going to meet the objectives uh, that we have. Uh, uh, I, I recommend you have a look at the material economics study, which showed that for a, a, a city of an average population size around 100,000, it's 1 billion euros to get to climate neutrality. I didn't bring my wallet this morning. I don't have, we don't have that kind of sums available. So it is going to come down to private finance. And as has been said brilliantly by your previous speakers, it's going to come down to, to innovation. Um, the EIB is engaging. They're ready to engage uh, in an innovative way with a, their panoply of different instruments from advisory, from uh, risk insurance under InvestEU, from, from project finance like Eleanor, which needs, by the way, to become more program finance as we, as we move forward. Look at what one city to the north of Europe is doing in its bid to be climate neutral. They've set up a revolving fund with a 25 million uh, euro first loss facility, which has brought in an additional 250 million euros. And that money is going to the renovation of the housing stock ready for 2030. Um, these kinds of new innovations, bringing in outside money, sucking in the huge amount of money that we heard talked about in Glasgow is really uh, a viable and a, 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 and a workable way forward. But again, as, as was well put by Kirsten, every city is different. Every city is going to have different needs, different problems, different traditions. We, uh, we like the idea, for example, of finding ways for cities to, in, uh, for citizens to invest in their own climate neutral futures through local green bonds, through crowdfunding schemes. There are as many ways to finance this project as there are to actually deliver on climate neutrality. And we've got to weave them in together and, uh, and I'm very confident we'll be able to do so. Great. So, uh, Olga, um, so you mentioned before that you are actually channeling the funds, the national funds, uh, towards the goals of, of climate neutrality. So on that part, you, you actually uh, seem to have to be mastering the, the finance challenge. But mm. so overall, what have you experienced now as being the main challenges um, of what you're doing with the climate um, city contracts. Yes, uh, so I would say so we are not uh, ch channeling it, but what we are doing, we are trying to provide the coordination and orchestration and push the national funding agency to coordinate their support uh, structures to, to cities. Because what we see now that we are talking very often that what cities should do, what cities should deliver, how cities should transform. But we say that we need to have transformation and alignment on different level, we need levels. So in, on the city, on the local level, regional level, on national level and European Commission level. So, so sometimes, so, so this is reciprocity and our climate city contract is actually the commitment by cities to, to become to accelerate transition towards climate neutrality, but it's also commitment of the national government, how, how national government should support cities in terms of policies and regulations, in terms of innovation, and in terms of coordinated funding. So, so we need to see this reciprocity that, okay, city would deliver if they get better support. Uh, so so this, I think that this is very important part of the, of the story of climate city contracting in Sweden, uh, so that we all need to transform. And I remember the first discussions at some national agency that would say, okay, uh, cities would do that and that, and probably we don't need to change. We are great in Sweden, but, but uh, nobody's saying this now. And I think that one, another instrument that we, we, we are using in Sweden is that uh, so, so we see the climate city contract as a governance innovation, not as a bureaucratic instrument. So we are revising climate city contracts every year, and this provides the learning platforms because every year where cities are looking at what we've done and, and also national authorities, what we have we done, what, what have we achieved, what have we learned, and how this learning would influence our next steps. 
So it's, it's, it's a huge learning opportunities. And then also it's a possibility for the, possibility for the uh, national authorities to maybe to redir redirect funds or, and also introduce new, new instruments, new financing instruments. I think the big challenge in funding is actually, uh, I mean, how we can attract this also and mobilize private funding, and what is the role of public uh, financing? So how can fa public financing be catalyzer and also maybe provide possibility to share risks with, uh, with private capital? So lending and lending facilities commission is uh, going to design is, is very, very crucial. Uh, so we hope that those kind of experiences and learnings could also influence how the climate city contracting is evolving uh, on the European level. Uh, but I think it's a lot of enthusiasm and also some kind of fear of risk that we do a new bureaucratic tool, which we should not do. And I, I'm confident that it will not happen. Okay. Kirsten, can I want maybe to just? Add? I was going to build on on your reflection and what something that Matthew said <coughs> uh, as well. I would have said the area of the greatest innovation needed with respect to f finance flowing into cities is what Matthew referred to as a shift from program a project logic to a program logic, and this connects very strongly to what you were saying about portfolios. The biggest challenge we have is that almost all forms of funding capital, private, public, philanthropic investment is looking for individual projects. And the transformation of a city at the scale that we are discussing here within the timeframes we're discussing has a degree of complexity that is so extreme, investing early in individual projects tends to draw us back and keep us in incremental solutions or in substitutional solutions because they're recognizable and they look like a discrete investable thing. Whereas here we really need portfolio finance, which is not financial portfolios, but place-based portfolios, where the city itself becomes a portfolio and where the investment, if anything, is in the future value of land, the future value of property, the future value of clean air, the future value of work that is well-designed and well-distributed and in close proximity. And that can be securitized and pulled back into future value release, into present value release, but it's really the structure of funding coming in at the level of a whole city, allowing for some flexibility so that the city and the, and the orchestration of innovation within cities can place quick, rapid bets to scale up many projects together and help them coalesce and form combinations of things so that we can solve for healthcare and air quality and mobility and infrastructure design together. We have the technologies to start to pull that together. We have the social innovations. We haven't got a design economically for how to really incentivize those kinds of combinations. And that's what this sort of platform of the mission really helps us try to do. Kirsten, can I uh, maybe <laughs> say someone likes your speech there. So Kirsten, maybe um, to dig a bit deeper into the, the finance um, topic. So what we finance is crucial, right? So, and the systemic uh, perspective is crucial as well. So in terms of electrification, decarbonizing, decarbonizing traffic, so uh, many funds are now put into um, e-charging infrastructure to um, electrify um, um, our, our private transport. Um, so will that be it? Or um, So I know the answer, of course, but I would like to know your perspective of how we do that. So how do, do we electrify while we make sure that we take other measures and we finance other measures that will reduce overall transport, will increase active mobility and so on. So how, how do we do both? How do we go both handed? Well, so I'll, I have a couple of observations from our experience. I know you have many other experiences and I'm sure Milan would have several. I think one is to really never forget that if we are simply investing in substitution of energy sources and we don't change the way we think it's okay to live and move, we will live in increasingly congested and impossible cities and we will run out of space because we have all of the trade-offs around how we manage also regeneration of the planet, diversity, etc., etc. So for me, practically, this means tying investment to a hierarchy whereby you literally encourage investment early in EV associated with physical movement, bikes, uh, scooters, you know, start with a hierarchy so that the last most expensive, latest to come is private 
um, light mobility vehicles, and then start to radically reduce parking spaces. So it becomes just practically very expensive to have an individually owned vehicle sitting for 80% of its time parked somewhere that's hard to get to and costs a fortune. It's like taking the, the effects of, for example, the way in which Climate, if climate catastrophe, climate change effects start to make homes uninsurable, just start to pull that into the way we structure mobility, make it unaffordable to have and own a car, or very, very difficult to own a private car. But of course, that comes with a set of investment structures that have to build up around how do we then really invest in public transport? How do we really invest in the design of proximity? So it's a constant relationship between decision-making at community and street level that help people understand the implications of trade-offs, and um, targeted, well-designed investment to support the pull-through of alternatives that are not simply substitute uh, individual cars with EVs, individually owned EVs, and actively maximize the opportunities in green spaces, which then also helps in healthcare. And that means starting to think economically about pricing in all of the things we love to call externalities that are actually direct impacts on our health, our schooling, our mental well being, our social cohesion, and so on. Because once you start to create that economic picture, it's not such a strange thing to make it very, very difficult to own an individual high carbon emitting car taking up a lot of space for a little time. So, Ariana, so from the perspective of the city, so you said air pollution obviously is a big problem in Milan. So how to achieve this reduction of private car use and how to transition to electric mobility in the city? So doing both. This is our two goals, the, the, the way of uh, reaching where we want to go. And uh, we think that we have to improve the public transport, improve in a very hard way. Because if you want to change uh, the way of living of the people, each person, you have to give her an um, uh, alternative way of moving. And we need to do this in the core of the city, in the big city, and in the neighborhood. So uh, the place in which we have to work is, uh, as Ada Colau said in the first part of this um, morning, is the metropolitan city. Uh, Milan is 100 and one, one million and 300 people. And metropolitan city is uh, 3 million and 500 people. So we need to make a relationship between, between the, the, the country and the way of using the road <clears throat> for the people. And to meet uh, the, the way of uh, looking the road by bicycle, by foot and by car. And we want to reduce the private use of the car and we want to reach the zero emission zone in the Cerchia dei Bastoni, the very core of the city, in which now is Area C. So we try to put an high level of our job, but we are public and we have to construct a relationship with uh, private, with university, with the way of thinking and we try to change uh, the cultural approach. It's a sort of uh, graduating objective, goals, for each person, especially for the person that is more far from this argument. And if we try to engage that, that people, we, uh, we reach the objective. And I think our major is trying to do this. And uh, the result of the next uh, election say to us that this is a good way. It's a difficult way, yeah. a very difficult way, in which private and public have to work together. And uh, the people is the protagonist of this job. And uh, I think it's if we realize this in Milan, in Italy, if we make a relationship with the city and the European goals, if we try to put uh, 
Green Deal going local. The, the way of thinking is a, f a great way of thinking. If, it, if in each town, each rich, uh, little and important town, we try to do the same thing. We are, we are going, we try to do this. I love that. So we need the Green Deal to go local. So Annalisa and, and Matthew, so I know that citizen engagement, bringing them in, into the whole dialogue and innovation process is close to your heart. So maybe you can comment, so Annalisa first and then Matthew, of the importance of um, bringing in the citizens and, and how we do that. Yeah, of course, it's it's super important. As I said, and it, we put it in the title uh, of the mission. If you if you look at the real title of the mission, it's not only about achieving, uh, you know, climate uh, hundred uh, climate neutral cities uh, by 2030, but also by and for the citizens. So it's really uh, uh, at the core of the concept. But for me, it's really about what I'm trying to stay positive about and trying to keep faith in is the capacity of the human mind to actually change. <laughs> that for me is the biggest challenge of all because if, you know, moving out of the silos, uh, trying to work together, as, you know, when you have different interests, uh, having different levels of government, just simply coordinating their own programs, uh, moving to a project, to a program approach, uh, you know, all these kind of things are all depending on, you know, the capacity of human beings <laughs> to actually change and, you know, work in a different way. And for me, this is what, uh, you know, this is really what we need to, to try and find ways to, you know, by, by action, by, by trying things and by actually bringing in citizens that are probably those that will change without even, you know, asking themselves uh, too much or, you know, silos, not silos, they'll just do things, we'll just do things. And then, then we can bring about uh, the real change if, you know, if it will be um, citizens that will ask decision makers to just stop that, do, you know, we want result, we want to achieve things, we want to give a better place uh, to our children to live and so on. That's that's what we need to keep uh, facing. So, you know, having, I think the best way for a mayor or, yeah, especially a, a local level to do the best help he can get or she can get is to have enough, you know, people and local actors and so on that ask for, for a change. Thank you, Annalisa. So, Matthew, with the big changes we need, um, so can we speed up by telling people what to do? Can we ban the use of private cars? So, what's your perspective on that? Well, following exactly on from what Annalisa and others have said, I love Ariana's call for the Green Deal to go local. Absolutely. If citizens feel this is being done to them rather than with them, it will not work. Um, and I really mean what I say when I, the, 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 this has to be a bottom up thing built with the cities and created, co created with the cities. And the same thing applies to our mobility. I've had a lot of my cycling friends saying, Where's the plan for cycling to make sure that everyone's cycling by 2030? Um, uh, 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 and, and others have uh, different schemes. That's not the Commission's role in this. This isn't the long wagging finger of the Commission saying, listen, cities, this is how you do it. This is how you consult your citizens. You must consult your citizens or it won't work, but we're not telling you how to do that. And the same thing goes for things like banning cars or banning anything. People who drive their cars into cities, here in Brussels, half a million of them a day from northern uh, Belgium, are not bad people. They're responding to the systems and the incentives we give them. If uh, the public transport isn't great, if you've got a free company car, if you can park for free at your office, no surprise, you take your car. We've got to change that pattern of systems, exactly as Milan was doing, create a different culture and different, uh, again, different incentives for people to do things differently. I think, again, if we get into the business of banning this or requiring that, it won't work. So it's a bottom-up exercise led by the cities, for the cities, with their citizens. Thank you. So anyone would like to maybe jump just on that? I do think that it's really important 
for us to, as we do this work, to remember that the city, a city is not where the city stops. And it, it is what you were referring to and what Matthew is describing. The really, really difficult complexity as a city is a set of complex interdependent relationships with the surrounding terrain. And that is a very hard set of community buy-in conversations to really try to understand reciprocal needs, concerns. So it's, you know, it is a really, as I said, it's an incredibly difficult thing to do, but to convene those conversations and discussions and a greater understanding of the choices and the options so that we do give people alternatives because otherwise it just doesn't work. Uh, I want to pick up on that and uh, I think we all agree, it's again, we all agree about what, that we need to involve citizens and then the civic legitimacy is totally crucial if we are getting to climate neutral by 2030 or not. Uh, at the, uh, but at the end of the day, it's again about why. Because, uh, I mean, we need to prototype, pilot and learn from each other of different methods for citizens' engagement and having those conversations. And I think that we need to do it on the national level, with the national context, but also you know, on the Euro European context. So we need to do it, a lot of work together just to, to have meaningful conversation and meaningful engagement of, uh, of the citizens. Also want to comment on the just again come back to the feasibility of what we are doing. So I've heard many times that the Swedish approach would not be scalable because scalability is, uh, is everything. It's kind of how to go from 100 cities to 1,000 cities, how to go with city for runners, larger city to small cities that don't have muscles. So, but, but then, no, so it's and then I've heard that, okay, Sweden is very special, alignment and, uh, and that, uh, high targets and so on and so forth. But now we have uh, uh, another national network which calls cities in, in Spain, with Spanish cities having climate city contract and very similar structure as viable cities. So I do believe that what we are doing is scalable. So, and then if Swedish cities can do, if Spanish cities can do, then of course Milano can do. And then we, we create the movement of willing, those who want to be a forerunners, and then we create the snowballing effects and demand for change among many, many uh, cities. So I'm really excited. Uh, for this, uh, for this journey, and I'm really excited to, to do it together with you guys. Thank you. Thank you very much. We could go on forever, actually, um, so with <laughs> this fantastic panel. We will do so next year, hopefully, and see where this all took us. Uh, so now I would like the uh, to give the opportunity to the audience, maybe, to ask uh, a question or two. We don't have a lot of time, but yes, I please. Do we have microphones? I don't know. No? More. Does this work? Yes. All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for a very interesting uh, discussion. My name is Alper Selik. Uh, I'm coming from the industry. I'm working in the automotive industry. Uh, well, we are basically actually uh, selling cars, producing, marketing, and selling cars. I've been listening to a very interesting concept today, uh, which is about including uh, the cities bottom up. That you was mentioning about this, and uh, Olga very rightly also underlined that uh, it's not about what, but it's about how. And here uh, I'm lacking one part to hear, and which is that uh, when you include the cities, or I would like to call it as the all stakeholders, uh, OEMs like ourselves, uh, we have a lot of expertise on selling products and services. And when it comes to um, bringing the policies, it's about selling a, a mission. And there, I have a very strong belief that actually uh, we could collaborate much better. And this is something I'm lacking to see in your uh, governance, in your regulatory activities, that uh, this lack of collaboration, uh, learning from each other. And again, uh, this is something that we do every day, this design thinking, prototyping, testing, learning about what sells, what does not sell. We do it for the product and the services, and mission is even much more meaningful. So we could even do it, I believe, much more simply. So uh, I would like to understand how you see this and what are uh, your, say, uh, plans in the future for such collaborations with the industry, especially with the OEMs. Okay, so 
a few people would like to comment. Olga, you raised uh, your hand I first. Could be. Uh, so first of all, of course, we have collaboration. Viable City is a member organization with more than 100 organizations, and more than half of them are industrial partners and, co and companies. So, so we, we have a lot of collaboration. Then in each the consortium of each cities of 23 that we have, we have uh, many industrial partners. And in climate city contracting, we have also process of local contracts where the, uh, I mean, based on the contract between the city and the national authorities, then we have a local contracts with, for example, construction companies and, uh, and uh, logistics companies. They are coming with their own commitments. They say, okay, so we will deliver this, we will have city to become climate neutral with, with, with what we are doing. And then we also want to have something back because it's a reciprocity again. For example, innovative pro, pro, pro innovation procurement and, and other rules. So, so we have those kind of relations and it's, it's businesses, it's civil society, it's academia. And this is so crucial, this quadruple helix, that uh, it's just probably we are not talking about that because we are living in our bubble thinking that, that this is just like uh, uh, broadly understood. Yeah. So, Matthew, I have to ask you to be very brief because I already got signs <laughs> to end the session. No, I can be. Olga said it all. I mean, uh, my apologies if we didn't stress the role of private uh, sector involvement. It's, it's the only way to go. Uh, it's working in viable cities. Just look down the road in Leuven where, you know, they've involved private se the private sector throughout, and that is why it's working. And I'm, I'm intrigued to get the help of the car industry because you're very good at selling your product. And we, <laughs> so let's work with together. Okay. Um, Okay, so the very final remark. Very, very. Just to build on that, because in fact, cl uh, Climate Kick, like Viable Cities, we're all communities. I think there's one thing about the involvement of industry, which is a huge opportunity, and that is the strategic risk of climate change for industry. So this is about designing together transformation of business models, industry models, and the markets that sustain those transformations. And that's very much part of this approach. Okay, thank you all so much. It's been very insightful. So we will bring the Green Deal to the local level. And we will look at it next year because also monitoring and tracking is one important element to making this mission a reality. So let's all um, uh, meet again soon and uh, latest next year. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you.